right, so here we are again for part two. I just decided to uh, stop and uh, t this is the technical end of the lecture period, but I decided to extend it a bit further and work through a longer example for anybody who wants to stick around. Anyway, so let's do this. I have one more example I want to work through, and this is going to be an example on um, pipes in series. So let me work through an example too. Uh, let's say example two, pipes and series. Let us look at pipes and series. Now I could also look at pipes in parallel, but that would be, that's really a topic for another class. I mean, you gotta get into some really uh, interesting equations. And those equations are, are, are actually very interesting. They uh, start to resemble the equations for uh, most familiar is actually if you're familiar if, if you're familiar with their physics background, it, they remind you a lot of the equations for uh, you know um, well electrical systems where you have uh, resistors and um, and uh, conductors in series and parallel etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm going to consider a system again full of water with a um, mu r dynamic viscosity equal to 2.34 times 10 to negative uh, 10 to negative 5. Uh, slug or pound seconds, pound second per uh, square foot, and our row water, our density mu and row water equal to 1.94 uh, slugs per cubic feet. Uh, slugs per cubic feet. Then I'm given this following um, pipe system, and what's interesting about this is I have a two I have a set of two reservoirs here. So I have a set of two reservoirs, and this is going to be kind of cool, according to certain definitions of cool. What I find interesting about this is that it dramatically and very literally illustrates the difference in what the, the physical interpretation of head loss. So I'm going to have a pipe that goes through two different diameters and it, on all these pipe all this pipe does is connect one reservoir to another reservoir. So I have two different reservoirs or two different tanks if you want to consider it like that. And these are going to be fairly long. So maybe reservoirs would be the right um, term. Actually, these are some pretty big pipes, so these aren't little tanks. So maybe a reservoir would be the, the proper term for this. And uh, let's say that I have point one here. This is going to be my point one, a free surface here. Uh, this is my point one. And then I have a lower uh, elevation level here at point two. And you may have heard the old adage that water always find its, finds its own level, which uh, to a certain degree is true, but this is not always this is not 100% accurate. In reality, water will find its own level except in the case of pipe friction. So, if you have a very short U bend and you feel, uh, say a, a U bend of, you know, clear plastic or something, you can very clearly see that water will find its own level. Like if you have a U shaped bend, like this, and you put water in one side, well, of course, will it will find its own level on the other end. And the same thing works on a very large scale. However, uh, this isn't perfect. There, is always, there are always going to be losses present in the system. And um, the earliest water systems in human history were all based on this kind of principle. You, that's how the Romans did it. You would have, they didn't have pumps. Well, they might have had some basic, uh, they might have had some basic Archimedes screw type things, but for all their large systems, they were all gravity fed. So they would go and find a, uh, you know, they would go and find a lake up in the mountain somewhere, and they would build a very long aqueduct to carry water to their fountains and baths and everything else wherever they needed it. And uh, in theory, at least, if you didn't consider losses, they would you would um, uh, you would have a uh, system that you know you could make water go as far as you wanted to, as long as the the end point was the same elevation or less than the starting point. But over time, they discovered that wasn't necessarily the case. They didn't uh, use the same terminology. They didn't have the same kind of scientific system we have now with units like meters or even slugs or whatever, what, whatnot. 
uh, the way they would do, do their designs instead is, through, is more through rules of thumb. So the kinds of things that developed uh, over years of expertise and Roman legionaries or whoever was building the thing and uh, or whoever slaves were building it. Um, it was ancient Rome after all. Um, so, um, but uh, the rule, the types of rules of thumb they would develop would be something like, oh, I don't know what kind of units they use in ancient Rome, but in modern units, it might be something like, well, for every thousand foot of aqueduct, you need a drop of half an inch or whatever it might be. You develop rules of thumb like that based on diameters of pipe, and that's how all ancient engineering was done. It was all based off of, if I want to build an arch this wide, it needs to have walls this thick, it needs to have a buttress this wide and this deep, and that's how all ancient engineering was done. They didn't know anything about the actual math and physics therein. They just had very rough rules of thumb that, you know, well, we built this thing last time like this out of this type of stone, and it worked last time, and Oh wait, the one we built just we built we tried building one a little taller and it fell over. Let's uh, build a little thicker next time. That becomes the rule of thumb among our local mason guild or what, whoever is building this thing. But uh, that has um, only something to do with fluid mechanics. So anyway, so um, I'm also given um, this relevant information, which I'm told that I have two different pieces of pipe, and that the first diameter is going to be two feet. So this is a big honking pipe. And I have a very long length of pipe, which is a thousand feet. So I have a thousand foot long pipe. And then I have an initial velocity, or, or a velocity in this portion of pipe equal to four feet per second. And then I'm told that I have a, um, this pipe will have a diameter two equal to 1.5 feet. And then uh, the length of this portion of the pipe, L2, is going to be 1500 feet. And in case it's not clear, the water really has to be flowing like this. Otherwise, there there is no way this would make sense at all. If you, um, if I found that the water was actually um, flowing the other way, things would be very, um, uh, very odd, uh, to say the least. Um, definitely violating the laws of physics if that were the case. Um, but anyway, so I w I'm actually being told the velocity here. I'm told the velocity at point one. I'll be able to, uh, in pipe one. I'll be able to easily find the velocity in pipe two. So what is there left to find? Well, what, le what is left to find is this, HL. I, I am told that there is some difference in elevation between these two reservoirs, but I don't know it. So we are tasked with calculating, find uh, total head loss. HL. And what I like about this is that this is a very physical interpretation of head loss. We literally have two big, two giant reservoirs, just two big lakes, essentially. You know, uh, that looks like, a, um, wait, uh, so a thousand, this is 1,000 feet and this is 1,500 feet. So these two big tanks or two big lakes are half a mile apart, these two big ponds, whatever they might be. And there's just a big honking pipe between them. And because of the losses, solely because of the losses in these two pipes uh, and the minor losses at the constrictions and such, these two lakes are going, or these two reservoirs are going to exist at different heights only because of the energy losses therein. Interesting. I, what I love about it is that the, it's just a very physical interpretation of head loss. And uh, I'm also told this is PVC pipe. So this is definitely not a Roman aqueduct. They were not known for building in PVC, but I'm sure if they had it, they would have used it. But uh, anyway. Uh, so we wanted to do that, and then let's work through this. So solution, and the first thing I'm going to do is um, set up a energy equation. So step one, set up energy equation uh, between one and two. Well, in this case, we're not really going to get much out of it, as you'll see. And I will know that P1 over gamma plus V1 squared over 2G plus Z1, just a nice Bernoulli, uh, equals P2 over gamma plus V2 squared over 2G plus Z2 is equal to our plus head loss or uh, just plus head loss. And then I can start canceling things out. Well, the velocities 
at both ends are zero, they're just free surfaces. The pressures at both ends are zero, again, because they're free surfaces in atmosphere. I can then find that head loss is just going to be equal to the difference in heights. So Z1 minus Z2 is equal to the head loss. Very simply, is equal to the head loss. Now, I need to consider uh, the major losses in each pipe. So my next step will be, so again, the this expression is kind of trivial. It's, I kind of alluded to it. It's, it's, it's almost really um, intuitive because we don't have any velocity at either point. There's no pressure or there's no uh, net pressure. There's no gauge pressure. So the, uh, the head loss is simply going to be the literal difference in elevation between the two um, free surfaces. So step two will be to calculate the uh, major losses first for pipe one and the next for pipe two. And we don't need to do any kind of iteration or anything like this. Uh, we already know the velocities, et cetera. It's going to be fairly straightforward. Uh, major loss in pipe two, or pipe one, I should say. Let's do one first. So let's just run through this. Really not that bad. Uh, Reynolds number. Obviously, we first need to get the Reynolds number. Um, actually, maybe I'll um, do this kind of thing here. I'll label some sections first. I would have um, Reynolds number. I'm going to label my sections first so it was in different colors for uh, clarity or for <coughs> reasons. Uh, then maybe relative roughness, just as a review. Relative roughness. Uh, relative roughness. Then I get the friction factor. And then I'll get the applied Darcy-Y Spock to get the overall um, major loss in pipe one. Uh, Darcy-Y Spock. So let's run through all these mini steps. Darcy Weisbach, and uh, so this is just going to be the Reynolds numbers, just rho vd over mu, and this is going to be 1.94 times uh, 4 feet per second, or just times 4, times uh, 2 feet, uh, times 2.34 times uh, 10 to the negative 5 for our viscosity. And this comes to 6.63 uh, times 10 to the fifth. And this is greater than 4,000, so therefore turbulent. Therefore turbulent. And then relative roughness. Uh, I am told it's PVC, which means I can usually assume that epsilon is 0 for smooth pipe. It doesn't mean that, that uh, Losses are zero because the fluid still exists, as we've discussed previously. Even though it's a smooth pipe, the fluid, or in this case, the water, still exists, still exerts friction against itself. So x epsilon over d is going to be just zero. And then from um, this, I can, uh, using Bernoulli, or not, sorry, not using Bernoulli, using the Moody diagram, I can say that the friction factor is equal to 0 0.0125, again, just feeding this and this, into the Moody diagram. And then HL major, uh, again, for pipe one, HL major one is going to be equal to F LV squared divided by 2GD. And this is equal then to 0.0125, just plug and chug from here, times a length of 1,000 feet uh, times four feet per second squared quantity squared divided by 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared times the diameter of 2 feet. And then I take all of this and I can say that the major head loss in pipe 1 is simply equal to 1.55 feet. 1.55 feet. 1.55 feet. Uh, next up, I'm going to calculate the major losses in pipe 2 using a similar procedure. So step, uh, well actually I guess that would be step 3. 
calculate major loss in pipe two. And uh, this one's gonna be a lot higher for two reasons. One, it's a, if we look here, it is a narrow, narrower diameter pipe and also the length is much longer here. So 1,500 feet over versus 1,000 feet. And more importantly, the diameter is much smaller. So the first, so let me la label the steps that lead for this. Now, we were given the velocity for the first one. We don't have velocity for the second one, so we're going to have to find it. So we'll need the velocity. Uh, we'll need Reynolds number. I'll just call that RE. Uh, we'll need the relative roughness. It's going to be the same, actually. Roughness. Uh, we'll need the friction factor. And then we'll need to apply Darcy Weisbach. So let's do this. The velocity, well, this is just going to be uh, very simple. It's just uh, V1 A1 equals V2 A2 just based off of the idea of conservation of flow rate because this is an incompressible fluid. And so then this will lead uh, inexorably to V2 is equal to 4 feet per second, 4 feet per second times uh, 2 feet, 2 feet quantity squared, um, uh, 2 feet quantity squared <coughs> divided by 1.5 feet quantity squared. And where those squares are coming from is I am given the diameters and I'm just basically dividing um, the, the the area equation, the uh, pi and the over 4 will cancel each other out. So all you have to do is divide by diameter squared. And I get that velocity 2 is equal to 7.11 feet per second. So that's going to have a substantial effect. See, the previous velocity was, what, was 4 feet per second. And we have a velocity of 7.11 feet per second. So yes, that is going to have a dramatic effect on our uh, losses here. Then the relative, so then the Reynolds number is going to be rho VD over mu, and this is equal to 1.94 uh, slugs per cubic feet times our velocity of 7.11 feet per second times the diameter of 1.5 feet over the dynamic viscosity of 2.34 times 10 to the negative, uh, 10 to the negative 5, uh, that's going to be pound second per foot squared, per square feet. And then that comes again to, or that, that will come to a Reynolds number of 8.84 times 10 to the fifth. And it comes as no surprise, this is turbulent, so therefore we will use, we will again use the Moody diagram. So relative roughness, again, epsilon is equal to zero. Therefore, epsilon over d is also equal to zero, so that will make the Moody diagram very easy. And if I take the uh, epsilon over d is equal to zero and our Reynolds number here and put them into the uh, Moody diagram, I get that the friction factor f is equal to 0 0.012. And then finally, um, for the head loss major, HL major in pipe 2, in pipe 2, is going to be equal to 0 0.102 or 0 0.012, and this is just using the exact equation from last time, so I'm not necessarily writing all this out. 0 0.012 times 1,500 feet uh, times 7.11 feet per second quantity squared divided by uh, 2 times 32.2 uh, feet per second squared. So feet per second quantity squared here, and just, then just uh, feet over second squared down here for g, and then times our diameter of 1.5 feet. And we get a dramatically different uh, head loss, HL major 2. And this is equal to 9, oh, sorry, this will be equal to 9.42 feet. 9.42 feet. So um, the previous, as a review, the previous pipe had a uh, length had a had a head loss of only 1.55 feet. This one has a loss of 9.42 feet. Again, it's because it's much longer, and more importantly, the diameter is much smaller. Okay, 
So next, our next step will be to calculate the minor losses and then combine all of this together into a final overall uh, head loss. So step four will be to calculate minor losses, again using tabular, uh, using results from tables. Uh, so step five, or step uh, four. Calculate minor losses. Uh, minor losses. First, I'm going to look at I'm, I'm going to look at a few different things. And in this pipe, let's go back here to the drawing. I'm looking at this, and I see three different loss locations. I see an entrance, an exit, and a restriction. Anytime there's any kind of major, um, anytime there's any kind of major a uh, change in the pipe geometry, that is a location of a minor loss. So I have an entrance to the pipe, an exit from the pipe into the tank, and a change in pipe diameter, or a restriction, as we'll call it. So I'm going to calculate it for the entrance, the exit, and the restriction, or sorry, the contraction. I, I, let me just call it the contraction instead. I think that makes a bit more sense, contraction. All right, so again, if I look at a table and uh, if I look at an entrance, again, assuming a, assuming a smooth entrance, I can find that KL um, for the entrance is, is going to be the same as previously. HL, uh, KL is going to be 0 0.5, at least for an entrance here. I got this from a table uh, in chapter eight of the text. Uh, HL minor then will be equal to, uh, HL minor is going to be equal to, let's say, uh, KL. Now I don't want to, I can't do the summation of KL like I did in the previous example. I can't do that method because we have different velocities in this case. So we can't do that because there are different velocities. So we have to calculate the, the uh, minor loss for each object or for each minor, for each uh, lo locality separately. KL times V1 squared divided by 2G and this is going to be 0 0.5 times 4 feet per second squared. 4 feet per second quantity squared divided by 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared. And this is then equal to uh, 0 0.124 feet, if I calculate that correctly. I have a minor loss from the entrance of 0 0.124 feet. And here, all from another table in the book, a table of um, with an exit on it, I get that KL is equal to 1.0. And for this, HL minor is equal to, again, KL. Um, and this time I'm going to use V2, because it's, it's the exit, we're and it's connected to the second piece of pipe. Uh, V2 squared divided by 2G equals, then, um, 1.0 times 7.11 feet per second, a 7.11 feet per second quantity squared, divided by 2g, which is 2 times 32.2, .2, uh, 2 times 32.2, and I get a minor loss here of 0 0.785 feet. Uh, 7 .8, or 0.785 feet. And then let us consider the contraction. Now, uh, what's tricky about this one is we might wonder which velocity to use. So, because that's kind of tricky. Do we look at which velocity do we consider? Well, um, there, if in, the in the text, there's actually a table for this, and it's based off of, um, it's, it's actually based off of a ratio of the two areas, so that's gonna take care of a lot of that. And the KL is going to be equal to, approximately equal to 0 0.2. It's based off of a um, for an area one over area two, which is approximately equal to 0 0.57. 0 0.57, so, and the KL for this is going to be approximately equal to 0 0.2, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and use the velocity two, even if it, uh, I believe the table actually mentions that, but if it doesn't, I would just use the larger velocity to be conservative. But um, I'm going to use the larger velocity because that will give me a, a larger loss, which would be something to plan for, you know, which is something you'd want to do in any kind of design. 
And anyway, now, so it's so, uh, finishing up then, HL minor <coughs> is equal to KL V2 squared over 2G. So when in doubt, use the larger uh, loss. And then this will e be equal to uh, 0 0.2 times 7.11 feet per second quantity squared. and then divided by 2 times 32.2. .2. And this is then equal to 0 0.175, or 157 feet. 157 feet. Okay. And my final last step, step 5. Uh, here, we'll get to calculate the total final loss. And this is going to be equal to, well, total loss will simply be the arithmetic sum of all of my, the previous calculated values. And this is just HL is equal to 1.55 feet plus 9.42 feet plus 0 0.124 feet plus 0, uh, plus 0. Uh, 785 feet uh, plus 0 0.157 feet. And this, the final answer, uh, final answer for the day is HL is equal to 12.03 feet. The overall loss of head is going to be quite substantial. It is 12 feet. So in other words, um, these reservoirs are literally going to have surfaces 12 feet. One is going to literally be 12 feet lower than the other. Uh, and that is entirely based on pipe friction, and that's on pipes that are fairly large in diameter. We're not talking. We're not trying to squeeze all this water through a, you know, a tiny, uh, you know, two-inch diameter pipe or a uh, half-inch diameter pipe, whatever you want to call it. It's it's going to be fairly small. Or it's, it's it's a very large pipe. And then one final note, I'd I'd uh, ask you to take note of just not some, just something to take note of. Uh, notice this is major. And this is minor. So if you note here, um, something to notice is that note, um, major losses are much greater. And this is typical of real world pipe systems. And that's why they're called major losses. Now, maybe if you have some sort of, now, um, it, I guess it depends what kind of system you're dealing with. If you're dealing with some sort of an industrial process where you have uh, refiner, even refineries, I'm, hes I'm hesitant to say even a refinery because uh, even refineries have fairly long lengths of pipe present in them, but maybe looking at an individual machine inside a refinery where you have a bunch of pipes and valves and uh, bends and everything else where you're flowing fluid in every which way and all that kind of thing. Maybe in some uh, in some mecha mechanical engineering applications, the minor losses would dominate. But in any kind of system where you have very long lengths of pipe, uh, in any kind of water delivery or a natural gas delivery system, an oil pipeline, anything like that, um, anything aside from now, in something like an engine, then minor losses would dominate. But in any kind of a uh, system with long linear lengths of pipe, the major losses are almost in every case going to be greater, which is why we refer to them as major losses. All right, uh, thank you. That'll do it for today. Um, thanks for um, putting up with me. Thanks for watching. And as always, thank you.